after doing a few projects with microcontrollers we get to the point where we need to choose two capacitors for the crystal at microcontroller pins right i'm talking about these two crystal capacitors at first we don't have a problem and usually we just copy others and choose a specific value but gradually a fundamental question arises what value should we really choose for these capacitors and what happens if we don't choose the right value because we see that different values are chosen in different circuits for example a circuit designer may choose 8 picofarads somewhere and he or she choose 18 picofarads in another situation that is when a fundamental question arises what is the correct value for these capacitors in this video, I want to introduce you to four methods for choosing the correct value for these capacitors. The first two are common methods that are mentioned in many places, but they are completely wrong and unprincipled and may mislead you to uh, cause problems. So you shouldn't use them. And at the end, I'll explain two other methods that are principled and correct way to choose the right and appropriate value for these capacitors. So stay with me for these few minutes and we will solve this problem of choosing the right capacitor value for the crystal together forever. For convenience, in this video, I'm going to call these capacitors C1 and C2. Okay, the first thing that I think we need to talk about is what problem occurs if the correct value is not chosen for these capacitors? Or, for example, you might even ask if I ignore these capacitors and don't use them at all, will there be a problem or not? If we ignore these capacitors and don't use them at all, the oscillator circuit inside this IC may not work at all, causing the microcontroller or any other IC that the crystal is connected to to stop working completely. But in some situations or some microcontroller ICs, it may seem that nothing special happens and the microcontroller works without these capacitors. In this case, not using the crystal capacitors may reduce the reliability of the circuit. For example, sometimes the microcontroller works and sometimes it doesn't. On the other hand, if the crystal capacitors have an incorrect or non-optimal value, they may still reduce the reliability of the circuit. Or even if the circuit always works and don't stop working due to the incorrect value of the crystal capacitors, it may not have our desired frequency. In fact, the main function of these capacitors is to establish balance in those later circuits so that the system can work exactly at the expected frequency. For example, if you choose different values for C1 and C2, you will have different frequencies in the oscillator circuit, okay? We found out that bad things can happen if the, these capacitors are not there or don't have the right value. So, it's better to not waste the time and go to the first method for choosing the value of the crystal capacitors. Method number one, fixed value. The first method that people usually learn to choose the appropriate, so-called appropriate value for the crystal capacitors is to use a fixed and specific value for C1 and C2 always and in all conditions. Values like 10 picofarads, 12 picofarads, you say that, 18 picofarads, or anything else like that. This method is the simplest method you can use, but uh, you have to be lucky that the number you choose is close to the optimal value, or at least is not a bad number. I strongly recommend that you do not use this method at all, because there are much better methods that I want to explain later in this video. This method is simple, but it may ruin your work, ruin your hard work so it's better to go to the next method method number two choosing the value based on the frequency some people use the crystal frequency as a criterion for choosing the appropriate value for c1 and c2 for example they think that for different frequencies there are specific values for choosing c1 and c2 for example for an 8 megahertz crystal they use a 10 picofarad capacitor for example and for a 16 megahertz crystal they use 18 picofarad capacitors in fact for each specific frequency they have a specific value for c1 and c2 to capacitors to use. If you are using this method for choosing the C1 and C2 capacitor values, I have a bad news for you. The bad news is that if this method is not worse than the previous one, it is certainly not better than it. 
That is, if you want to choose a value for C1 and C2 based on the crystal frequency, your work is not much different from choosing a fixed number for C1 and C2 because in this case, you also have to be lucky that the value you choose is close to the optimal value. So, this method, contrary to its appearance, is not a very good method and I strongly recommend that you do not use this method. Here we can conclude that there must be a better method for choosing the right value for C1 and C2 because we have seen that professional designers choose different values for C1 and C2 in different conditions and in different circuits for the crystal with the same frequency. Here in this video, we want to see that what is the best and principled method for choosing and determining the right value for C1 and C2. Method number three, referring to the IC datasheet. The crystal that we want to use is going to be connected to an IC, right? For example, to a microcontroller or another type of IC. Usually the IC manufacturer in the datasheet of those ICs suggests a value for C1 and C2. For example, if you want to choose the value of C1 and C2 for a crystal that is connected to an SCM32 microcontroller, you can refer to the datasheet of that IC. For example, I have brought the datasheet of the STM32F030KXT6 microcontroller IC here to review together. This IC is a 32-bit microcontroller made by ST, which I use a lot in my projects. If we go to the page 54 here page 54 we can see that it says for cl1 and cl2 it is recommended to use high quality external ceramic capacitors in the 5 pico to 20 pico farad range typically that is we can conclude that the capacitance of the capacitors should be chosen between 5 pico farads and 20 pico farads for c1 and c2 capacitors Anyway, the data sheet says that a number between 5 picofarads and 20 picofarads should be chosen for the capacitors. That is, it doesn't specify an exact number, but at least we can understand that it shouldn't be less than 5 picofarads or more than 20 picofarads, right? So far, we have gained some information that we no longer choose a very wrong and inappropriate value. That is, in fact, we know that the optimal number is probably between 5 picofarads and 20 picofarads, but we still don't know the exact value. To get the exact value, we have to calculate it with a special formula and see exactly what value we should use for C1 and C2 capacitors. Method number 4, exact calculation with formula. Well, here we have reached the main part of this video, which is learning the best method for determining the optimal value for C1 and C2 capacitors. This formula is a good tool for determining the best value for the C1 and C2 capacitors. Usually we consider C1 and C2 to be equal, except in special conditions where the oscillator circuit is not symmetrical. If we consider C1 and C2 to be equal, we can simplify this formula. Here we are looking for the value of the parameter C which is equal to C1 and C2. To find this parameter, we need to find the values of CL and C stray. In fact, if we have the values of CL and C stray, the values of C1 and C2 capacitors will be equal to C. That is CL minus C stray multiplied by 2. For example, if CL is equal to 18 picofarads and C stray is equal to 7 picofarads, the values of C1 and C2 capacitors will be equal to 2 times 18 minus 7, 
that is 2 times 11 uh, equal to 22 picofarads. That is, in this condition where CL is equal to 18 picofarads and CS3 is equal to 7 picofarads, C1 and C2 capacitors should be chosen equal to 22 picofarads. Remember that this 22 picofarad has nothing to do with this 5 picofarad to 20 picofarad range which is specified in this data sheet because these values are specific values for the uh, IC STM32 F030 K6 T6 and has nothing to do with this condition where these numbers are imaginary numbers and they are just a numerical example. Here you may ask what CL and CS3 are and how to get their values. You are right because it's a very good question and many people may not know what CL and CS3 are and how to get their values. I'm going to start with CL because getting its value is very simple. CL, which is known as the load capacitance, is one of the inherent characteristics of the crystal component that we use in the project. To get the value of CL, just refer to the crystal datasheet. Every component you want to use must have its datasheet. For example, there is a specific datasheet for all these components, which is provided by the manufacturer. I have printed the datasheets of a few samples of these crystals to review together and see how the load capacitance is determined in these datasheets. Usually on the first page of the datasheet, there is a parameter called load capacitance, which determines the exact value of the load capacitance for the crystal. For example, here, it says uh, 18 picofarads load capacitance, 18 picofarads, or here it says 10 picofarads load capacitance, 10 picofarads, or it is 20 picofarads for this one. Getting the CL value was very simple, right? But the CS3 value may be a little more complicated. In the following, we want to see how to get the CS3 value. Actually, there are many ways to get the CS3 value, but before we get the CS3 value, we need to know what CS3 value is, then we can get its value. We are going to place a crystal here to complete the oscillator circuit needed for the microcontroller. We know that there are circuits inside the microcontroller for oscillator circuitry and we also need to connect the crystal to that oscillator circuit inside the microcontroller using connections. Here unwanted capacitors are definitely created between these connecting tracks and also the circuits inside the microcontroller which interfere with the oscillator's operation. This unwanted capacitor which is created between XL1 and XL2 tracks on the PCB is called C stray. So far we have understood what C stray is and now we need to see how to get its value. This value that we want to get is the last link in the chain that leads to calculating the value of C1 and C2 capacitors at the crystal pins. To get the exact C stray value, it is better to solder the microcontroller on the PCB and measure the unwanted capacitor between XTAL1 and XTAL2 pins using an LCR method before soldering the crystal and capacitors on the board. Note that nothing extra should be connected to XTAL1 and XTAL2 pins, just the microcontroller IC and that's it. The crystal or C1 or C2 capacitors should not be soldered on the PCB when measuring C stray. For example, I want to test this PCB and measure the exact C stray value for this PCB. First, I solder the microcontroller on this board and then get the C stray value for this board. Look at the LCR meter display, here it shows a value of 6.7 picofarads, which is the CS3 I was looking for.
I got the CL value by referring to the data sheet and realized that it is 18 picofarads. Now I can use this formula and substitute the CL and the CS3 values to get the appropriate and optimal values for C1 and C2 capacitors. With this information that I have, I should use a value of 23.4 picofarads for C1 and C2 to get the best result. Here, some folks who don't have an LCR meter may be disappointed and say that I can't get the CS3 value. Well, if you don't have an LCR meter, you can estimate the CS3 value. For example, for circuits that have a very good and professional PCB light design and the component density is not very high, you can consider the CS3 value between 3 and 5 picofarads. For circuits that have a good PCB light design but the component density is high, you can consider the CS3 value between 5 and 10 picofarads. And for the circuits that have a very poor PCB light design or the circuit is assembled on a breadboard, you can consider the CS3 value above 10 picofarads. For example, 12 picofarads or 15 picofarads. Okay, my friend, the result is that to get the optimal value of C1 and C2 capacitors, you have to refer to the crystal datasheet and get the CL value from there and then measure the CS3 value using the LCR meter and use the formula that I gave you to get the optimal value for C1 and C2 capacitors. It is not very difficult, right? Anyway, thank you, my friend, for watching me. Thank you for staying with me until the end of this video. If you enjoyed watching this video or learned something new, please like this video and subscribe to my channel and activate the notification bell because I'll come back to you with much better videos. Until the next video, take care and have a good one.